What I want to talk about tonight is dependent origination, dependent arising sometimes, sometimes dependent co-arising or dependent co-origination. I don't use the co because uh, people start talking about codependent origination and yeah, no such thing. So dependent origination or dependent arising. Usually it's talked about as 12 links. And it's kind of obscure what's going on there. Carolyn Reese Davids, who was one of the early translators from Pali into English, referred to dependent origination as a curious old rune. And a number of other people have made similar sorts of statements. So we could jump in with the 12 links, but you know, it just might make more sense to start at the beginning. I mean, what a novel concept, right? So I mentioned earlier, there's a collection of suttas called the Sutta Nipata, the little sutta collection. And I talked about book four and said the overriding theme was uh, not holding to fixed views. There's other stuff in there as well. And one of the suttas in there is number 411. So Sutta Nipata 411. It's entitled Quarrels and Disputes. And in that, Someone ask a question, where do quarrels and disputes come from? The answer is that people find things endearing, which of course raises the question, why do people find things endearing? Well, because they're desirable. Well, then why do people find things desirable? It is said, it is pleasant, it is not pleasant. From whence comes the pleasant and the unpleasant? The pleasant and unpleasant arise from contact. What is contact dependent upon? Nama Rupa. More literally translated name and form. Sometimes you see it translated as mind and body, mentality and materiality. So you've got this sequence. Quarrels and disputes arise dependent on endearing, rise dependent on desirable, rise dependent on pleasant and unpleasant, rise dependent on contact, arises dependent on name and form, namarupa. This, I think, is the original dependent origination teaching. Book four, as I mentioned, the scholars consider this to be very early material. And this seems like very early material. It's much less complex. You only got a few links. You don't have 12. And it actually makes some sense. Now, If you're familiar with the 12 links of dependent origination, uh, it's not the same names. It's different names showing up in the 12 links. In the 12 links, instead of talking about quarrels and disputes, it talks about old age, sickness, and death, or in other words, dukkha. So we could ask, what does dukkha arise dependent upon? Well, corresponding to the endearing would be clinging. What do you cling to? The stuff that's dear to your heart. You have a pair of worn out socks with holes in them. And somebody says, hey, can I have those socks? You're like, yeah, sure. You're not clinging to them. You're you're not endeared to the worn out socks, right? But somebody says, oh, can I have your new iPhone 12? Like, no way. This is mine. And then the things you cling to, you cling to because you crave them or you find them desirable. 
those, that, that matches up quite well. In fact, often in the suttas, we do find desire and craving used synonymously. Sometimes there's shades of difference, but sometimes they're just identical. And then craving arises dependent on Vedana. And what are Vedana? Pleasant or unpleasant or neither. So it is pleasant, it is not pleasant, it is basically the same thing as Vedana. And Vedana arise dependent on contact, just like it is pleasant, it is not pleasant. And contact depends upon, well, in some of the recensions of dependent origination, it says the six senses, and then it says the six senses are dependent on Nama Rupa. But in other recensions, we find that contact is said to be dependent on Nama Rupa. And yeah, I mean, that makes sense. If you don't have a mind or a body, you're not going to be getting sense contacts. So you've got to have a mind and body to get sense contacts. So we've got these parallel tracks. We got the old style, quarrels and disputes, and dukkha for the new. We got endearing and clinging. We got desirable and craving. We got it's pleasant, it's not pleasant. We got Vedana. We got contact, exactly the same. And we got Namarupa, exactly the same. And then those updated ones eventually turn into not six links, but 12 links. So you might be wondering, well, where where'd these other words come from? And why did it turn into 12 links? The Vedas are some of the earliest spiritual literature in India. It's literature that was created so long ago, we're not even sure how long ago. And it was an oral tradition. The Vedas were memorized. I mean, they didn't do writing when the Vedas were written down. They didn't do writing when the Buddha was around. It was all oral tradition. And amongst the Vedas is the Vedic hymn of creation. And guess what the Vedic hymn of creation talks about? Well, it talks about the exact same 12 items that are found in the 12 links of dependent origination. What I'm guessing happens, the Buddha starts teaching dependent origination in this original form with quarrels and disputes, endearing, clinging, pleasant, unpleasant, contact, and nama rupa. And somebody, one of his Brahmin disciples, because actually the majority apparently of the Buddhist disciples were Brahmins, who knows the Vedic hymn of creation, points out the similarities. And either the Buddha switched to using the words from the Vedic hymn of creation, or at some later point, dependent origination switched to using the words, but not all of them initially. We find some suttas where it's exactly the same as in Sutta Nipata 411, but just using the six words that correspond from the Vedic hymn of creation. But once you had those words there, other words from the Vedic hymn of creation start creeping in. And it goes from six to nine to 10 to 11 to 12, and all the words have crept in but with a different interpretation than the Vedic hymn of creation. Same words, different tune. And then we wind up with the 12 links, which, let's face it, actually don't make nearly as much sense as the six links that we started with. But it's worth taking a look at them. And the The most famous way of looking at them is the Tibetan Wheel of Life. It's a bunch of concentric circles being held by Yama, the Lord of Death. You can see his fangs up at the 12 o'clock position and his claws at 10 and 2 and his other claws down at 4 and 8 and his tail down there at the bottom. And he's holding this 
circle with concentric circles, like a, like a bullseye. And in the middle, in the bullseye position, there's a rooster, a snake, and a pig, each biting the tail of the other. These represent greed, hatred, and delusion. The rooster is greed, the snake is hatred, and the pig is delusion. Then in the next circle around that, there are beings coming out of states of woe and getting into very good states, but then falling back down into states of woe. This is samsara. It just goes round and round. The next circle out from that is where the artist has the most fun. And this depicts the six realms of existence. The bottom level connect, depicts the hell realms, plural. And they, they, there are all sorts of nasty things going on there. People being boiled in oil, walking through a forest where all the leaves are swords, being eaten by various creatures, you know, all the good stuff. I mean, something Dante would be proud of. And then above that, you have the realm of the hungry ghost. The hungry ghost in a previous life were very greedy. And now they've died and been born in this realm where they have little tiny necks and great big bellies. They can never get enough. Another of the lower realms is the realm of the Asuras, the warring gods, and they're always fighting. I believe their headquarters is in a large five-sided building just south of Washington, D.C. Another of the lower realms is the animal realm. This is the only one we usually see in that, yeah, the artist has fun painting deer and bunny rabbits and, you know, all the cute little animals. And then above that is the human realm. And the artist paints people doing human things, working, eating, having fun, etc. And then up at the top are the heavenly realms. And that's what you would expect. People sitting on clouds. Well, they're playing lutes rather than harps. They're eating ambrosia. That circle, that takes up most of the painting. But the important one is the one on the outside. And that depicts the 12 links of dependent origination. Starting at the top, we have an old blind person trying to make their way through the forest. This represents ignorance. Uh, ignorance is not knowing. Ignorance, not knowing. And that rising dependent on ignorance are sankharas. Sankara is a really important word. It, it's often translated in the context of dependent origination as karmic formations. However, <laughs> Well, that's a really poor translation brought on by the fact that people want to use dependent origination to prove they're not going to die. Everybody's got their immortality projects and dependent origination is used as part of the orthodox immortality project. I'll go into that in a bit, but Sankara more broadly would refer to anything that's created, anything that's made. So your computer is a sankara. The building you're in is a sankara. You're a sankara. I'm a sankara. And so it's all the things of creation. Probably a much better translation would be fabrications. That's from Tanasaro Bhikkhu. Or my favorite, concoctions from Santikara. So dependent on ignorance, concoctions arise. Concoctions are depicted as a potter sitting in a wheel making pots. And some are very nice and some are misshapen and some are broken. Some of the things are creation, some of the concoctions are good and some are broken. Dependent on concoctions is consciousness. Consciousness is depicted as a monkey swinging from one branch to another. Perhaps you have encountered this monkey mind at some point in the recent past. 
dependent on consciousness is mind and body, nama rupa. And that's depicted as two people in a boat. One is standing up, pulling the boat along, and the other is just along for the ride. So this is a homework question for you. Who's pulling the boat? Who's deciding where the boat goes? Is it the mind or the body? You can tell me in your next interview. It's a, it's a good insight into the nature of reality. So contemplate it. Dependent on mind and body are the six senses. That's depicted as a house that has five windows and a door. Five windows, the five external senses, and the door representing the mind. Arising dependent on the six senses is contact. That's a couple embracing. Arising dependent on contact or Vedana. That's depicted as a man having arrows shot into his eyes. Unpleasant Vedana. Arising dependent on Vedana is craving. And craving is depicted as a very fat person sitting at a table that's heavily laden with food. Arising dependent on craving is clinging. And clinging is depicted as someone picking fruit and putting it into baskets that are already so full, the fruit simply rolls out onto the ground. Arising dependent on clinging is becoming, and that's a pregnant woman. And arising dependent on becoming is birth, and that's a woman with a newborn. And arising dependent on birth is old age, sickness, and death, pain, sorrow, grief, lamentation, despair, and all the rest of the dukkha. And that's depicted as a corpse. And that takes us around the circle. Now, there's nothing in the suttas that indicates it goes multiple times. I mean, the circle doesn't appear in the suttas. The, the links are appearing quite frequently. So what does this mean? Well, it helps to think of them in the reverse order. Old age, sickness, and death is dependent on birth. If you don't get born, you don't experience any dukkha, right? You ever hear anybody who didn't get born complaining about dukkha? I never heard anybody like that. Of course, it's not a solution for you because I can tell every one of you went and got born already. So uh, we're going to have to find something else. So arising dependent on birth is becoming. And it appears Mother Nature has this urge to become. In the spring, birds do it, bees do it. Yeah, this urge to reproduce. Of course, any species that has no urge to reproduce <laughs> doesn't reproduce and dies out. And yeah, we don't have any record of those. Becoming is said to arise dependent on clinging. And that's a kind of a weird, weird jump. It, it doesn't go real smoothly. Think about the things you're clinging to. Does that give you some idea of reproducing or anything like that? Probably not. I mean, maybe, but a little bit weird there. I mean, you could look at the building you're in and notice that it's held together by all of the pieces clinging together and then it becomes a building. But that's changing the becoming context quite a bit. But remember, we're pulling these words out of the Vedic hymn of creation, not from the original sutta. It didn't have birth and becoming in it. Arising dependent on clinging is craving. Makes sense. The stuff you cling to is the really good stuff. And the really good stuff, that's what you crave. And the craving arises from the pleasant and the unpleasant Vedna. The pleasant leads to craving to get it. And the unpleasant is craving to get rid of it. The craving and clinging, the craving is I want to get it. And the clinging is, I got it and I want to keep it. The craving is focused on the object and the clinging is focused on the subject, the one who owns the object. Craving arises dependent on Vedana, the pleasant and the unpleasant. 
and the Vedna arises dependent on contact. When there is a sensory contact, a Vedna is actually going to arise. Contact is a sufficient condition for the arising of Vedna. Contact depends on the senses, and the senses depend on Nama Rupa, mind and body, which, yeah, has to be animated by consciousness. I mean, if you have a mind and body with no consciousness, it ain't going to last long. I mean, yeah, they can stick tubes in it and feed it and so forth, but uh, it's not really alive, not really existing. And then consciousness is dependent on sankharas. Consciousness always has to have an object. But consciousness is also said to be dependent on namarupa, mind and body. Consciousness arises due to the interaction of mind and body. You don't find consciousness wandering around without a mind and body associated. Well, maybe they do in England. You know, they have lots of ghosts over there. But, you know, I've never encountered a consciousness that wasn't associated with a mind and a body. They seem to be interdependent. It's sort of like the two are dependent on each other. Mind and body depends on consciousness and consciousness depends on mind and body. You pull one away, the other falls over as well. Like two sheaves of wheat leaning against each other. So what does it all mean? Well, the orthodox interpretation, the official Theravadan Buddhist interpretation is found in the Vasudhimaga, and it describes three lifetimes. Your previous life is ignorance and they say karmic formations, although that's not what the word means. It means concoctions or fabrications. And so in your previous life, you were ignorant and you generated karma. And now in this life, you're born and due to the previous karmic formations, you have a certain type of consciousness, which gives rise to a certain type of mind and body, which has senses, which gets sense contacts that produce Vedna. And if you're not careful, it's going to lead to craving and clinging. And that's this lifetime. And because you're clinging to being alive, when you die, you have this urge to become again, and you're reborn, and of course you're going to die there too. So the becoming birth and death is your next lifetime. There's a number of serious logical problems with this interpretation, including the fact that the Buddha frequently says with the ending of ignorance, there's the ending of sankharas. With the ending of sankharas is the ending of consciousness. With the, All the way up to the with the ending of birth, there's the ending of death. So, yeah, to get out of this mess, get rid of all the dukkha, you just need to uh, get rid of all the ignorance in your previous life. Yeah, you can do that. You don't even remember your previous life. And even if you did, how are you going to go back and change your previous life to get rid of the ignorance? That's not going to work. I don't think the Buddha would make a stupid logical mistake like that. Furthermore, in Majjhima 28, Sariputta quotes the Buddha as saying, one who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. One who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. The two are essentially the same. And the Buddha says that the Dhamma is timeless, visible here and now. So that would mean that dependent origination is visible here and now. Mm, how many of you can actually see three lifetimes here and now? You can see one, this current life, but can you see your future life and your past life? Probably not. So I don't think the orthodox interpretation is any good at all. I think it's quite useless. I Actually, I think it's worse than useless. I think it causes a lot of confusion and leads people in the wrong direction. A much better interpretation is the so-called moment-to-moment interpretation. The moment-to-moment interpretation is probably best described by Ajahn Buddha Dasa, who was one of the great Thai forest monks of the previous century. He has a book called Heartwood of the Bodhi Tree about not self that I highly recommend. 
And he has another book entitled Under the Bodhi Tree, which is about dependent origination. So if you're interested in a book on dependent origination, by all means, get Under the Bodhi Tree. And what he says is we're to look at this happening moment to moment, basically with every sense contact. I'll give you an example. Let's say you go to the grocery store and you're wandering around the produce section and you see a sign that says mangoes and you're like, well, mangoes are supposed to be good. I never had a mango. I, 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 should, I should check this out. And so you buy a mango. And let's say you buy a nice ripe one and you take it home and you put away the rest of the groceries and now you attack the mango. And of course you make a big sloppy mess because that's what happens when you attack the mango the first time. But eventually you have a piece of mango in your fingers, your juicy fingers. All right, you have a conscious mind and body that has senses and now contact. Pleasant Vedna. Oh, very pleasant. I'm going to have some more. This is great. This is so good. Craving has set in. I'm going to get me a lot of mangoes. I'm going to get a mango every time I go to the store. In fact, my friends, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice, they've never had a mango. I'm going to turn them on to the mangoes. So you go back to the store, you get another mango, you go see your friends. This is obviously not during COVID. And you take them a mango and they're like, oh, cool, a mango. And they, they love it. It's great. And every time you go see your friends, you bring them a mango. You have become the mango bringer. You have now given birth to yourself as the mango bringer. And this is wonderful for a while until their friends go, what's with all the mangoes? Uh-oh death of the mango bringer. So what we're giving birth to isn't a physical birth, but birth of a sense of self. And we're getting these sense contacts and we're doing the craving and clinging thing. And of course, if there's craving or clinging, there has to be somebody there that wants to get it or has got it and is hanging on to it. So you're becoming a self that you give birth to. So the craving and clinging actually has to have a self there to begin with. So you're reinforcing that sense of self. But whatever you're clinging to is impermanent and not ultimately satisfying. And when it changes and goes away, then you experience the dukkha. Now, this is a much healthier way to interpret dependent origination. But I still don't think that's what the Buddha was all about. I think he was actually just taking a subset of that and saying, look, the dukkha arises because of your craving and clinging. The craving and clinging is arising because of the Vedana, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. And that's just a side effect of contact. And contact happens because you've got a mind and body. Pay attention to your sensory contacts. Don't get lost in the Vedana. Get your mindfulness in there at the Vedana. Second establishment of mindfulness, Vedana. Get your mindfulness in there and don't get lost in craving and clinging. And then you won't be experiencing dukkha. So I think the subset actually is the most important aspect of it. And throwing in becoming and birth, and that adds confusion. And the six senses, probably not really necessary. And consciousness, well, okay, that's all right. When we look at the suttas, we find that there are, as I say, many different recensions of dependent origination, some with just one or two links or four or eight or 10 or 12 or whatever. So I think the best is to pick these particular links out and see what they're saying, because this is what teaches us what's really going on. But having said all of that, the links of dependent origination are examples Remember back to the first talk on the Four Noble Truths? After his awakening, the Buddha said, this generation is addicted to its lifestyle. It's very difficult for people addicted to their lifestyle to understand this important thing. 
Itapataya cha paticca samapada. This, that conditionality dependent origination. The this, that conditionality is the general case. This arises dependent on that. If that doesn't happen, this doesn't arise. This is basically necessary conditions, which actually seems to have been something that wasn't widespread and understood at the time of the Buddha. And so this, this, that conditionality, the general case, is actually, I think, much more important than the 12 links or six links or anything else, which are just examples of that. In fact, I would say the 12 links are actually a collection of necessary conditions and are just a mnemonic device for remembering a bunch of useful necessary condition relationships. And trying to interpret the 12 links as anything is, yeah, it's just not going to work because that's not what's going on. There's a historical reason why we wound up with 12 and so forth. But what the Buddha was really saying was the subset of you have a mind and body that's going to get contacts. The Vedna are going to rise. Get your mindfulness in there so you don't do the craving and clinging and wind up with dukkha. That's the links. But the general case in its most general form is everything arises dependent on other things. Nothing stands by itself. When we start looking at the world around us, we notice, yeah, everything arises dependent on other things. I mean, look at the stuff around you right now. Your computer <laughs> That arose dependent on a whole bunch of stuff. Some sand got turned into silicon, which got turned into chips. Somebody assembled it. There had to be the store where you bought it, even if the store is Amazon. And then somebody had to put the internet together so you can actually be seeing and hearing me while I'm talking. There's a lot of dependencies there. And then, of course, there's the food that you ate today that you... You are rising dependent on that food, but that food didn't magically appear in your place. Somebody had to go shopping for it and somebody had to grow it. And we could go on for hours pointing out that everything is arising dependent on other things. The way I like to say it is there's nothing but streams of dependently arising processes interacting which I call SODAPI, S-O-D-A-P-I, streams of dependently arising processes interacting. That's all there is in the universe. We are at the intersection of a bunch of streams of dependently arising processes. There, there's the food that dependently originated. We are what we eat. That's going on. But there's also the air. Yeah, the air got put here a long time ago, but that's because eventually some creatures started exhaling oxygen and built up the oxygen in the environment so that oxygen breathing creatures could be around. There's your clothing. There, that's dependently originated. Somebody made it and they made it out of some sort of fibers that were either grown or manufactured out of dead dinosaurs or something. It's all dependently originating. It's all processes. We, we think that there are nouns, but actually it's, it's processes. You're not a noun, you're a verb. You're a collection of processes. There's your digestive process and your circulation process and your endocrine process. You're just a heap of processes sort of bound up with a bunch of skin. It's all very dynamic. In fact, I like to say there aren't any nouns. It's just that some verbs move kind of slow. So streams of dependently arising processes interacting, that's all we find. Nothing really solid there. And this is useful for answering you know, some fairly important questions. Maybe the most important questions about life and death. 
So I'm going to share a sutta with you. This is number 38 in the Middle Length Discourses, the Greater Discourse on the Destruction of Craving. This discourse is kind of interesting. It's actually two suttas, two discourses put together to make one. And the first discourse is the destruction of bhava tanha, craving for becoming. And the second one is the destruction of kama tanha, craving for sense pleasures. And the first one also has been tampered with, it looks like, and there's a bunch of extra material stuck in there. When we get to that, I'll point this out. So, thus have I heard. Once the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jaitas Grove on a Tapindikas Park. Now, on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in a bhikkhu named Sati, the son of a fisherman. He thought, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. Okay, so Sati thinks his consciousness is his self. He's, he's noticed, yeah, the body, that's not going to work. Vedna, that's not going to work. Sanya, not going to work. Thoughts, emotions, memories, no. Nope. But consciousness, right? So when I die, my consciousness will go find another birth. Several bhikkhus heard about this and went to Sati and asked him, is this true? Is this what you think? And Sati said, exactly so, friends. And those bhikkhus, desiring to detach him from this pernicious view, questioned and cross-questioned him, saying, Friend Sati, do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus, for in many ways the Blessed One has stated consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness. But though questioned and cross-questioned, Sati would not give up his pernicious view. And so those bhikkhus went to see the Blessed One, told him what had happened. And the Buddha says, you tell Sati the master calls. So that bhikkhu went and found Sati and said, friend Sati, the master calls. So Sati went to see the Buddha, saluted, sat down at one side. As he was sitting there, the Blessed One asked him, Sati, is it true that you think, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another? Exactly so, Venerable Sir. As I understand the Dhamma taught by you, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. What is consciousness, Sati? Venerable Sir, it is that which speaks and feels and experiences here and there the results of good and bad actions. What do you think of Sati's definition of consciousness? It's that which speaks. So when you're talking, it's your consciousness deciding what to say. It's what feels, what experiences the Vedna. You're conscious of pleasant, unpleasant neither, and experiences the results of good and bad actions, gets the karmic resultants. Sound like a good definition of consciousness? The Buddha replies, misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways consciousness to be dependently arisen since without a condition, There is no origination of consciousness. But you, misguided man, have misrepresented us by your wrong grasp and injured yourself and stored up much demerit. For this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. I don't think the Buddha approved of Sati's definition. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus. Bhikkhus, what do you think? Has this bhikkhu sati kindled even a spark of wisdom in this dhamma and discipline? No, venerable sir. How could he have, venerable sir? When this was said, the bhikkhu sati sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping, head down, glum, and without response. 
Then knowing this, the blessed one told him, misguided man, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. And here we are two and a half thousand years later, recognizing poor old Sati by his pernicious view. I shall question the bhikkhus on this matter. Bhikkhus, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me like Sati? No, venerable sir. For you have stated many times that consciousness is dependently originated. Good. It is good that you understand the Dhamma that way. Bhikkhus, consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on I and forms, it's reckoned as I consciousness. When it arises dependent on ear and sounds, ear consciousness. Nose and smells, nose consciousness. Tongue and taste, tongue consciousness. Body and tangibles, body consciousness. Mind and mind objects, mind consciousness. Just as a fire is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it burns. When fire burns dependent on logs, it's reckoned as a log fire. When fire burns dependent on faggots, it's reckoned as a faggot fire. When fire burns dependent on grass, a grass fire. Burns dependent on cow dung, a cow dung fire. Burns dependent on chaff, a chaff fire. Burns dependent on rubbish, a rubbish fire so too in the same way for consciousness. So the Buddha is saying that consciousness is rising dependent on sense contact. So we've got now consciousness dependent on sense contact, on name and form, and on sankaras. Well, is this a contradiction? Well, no, it's dependent on all of these. I mean, the lights in your room, they're dependent on the light switch, they're dependent on the power lines, and they're dependent upon the power station. So things can be dependent on multiple other things, and that's what we're finding here. And then the general questionnaire on being begins. Bhikkhus, do you see this has come to be? Now the commentaries make a big fuss over trying to figure out what the this is that has come to be. And they decide, the Buddha pointed to his body. You see this body's come to be? However, I think what the Buddha's at actually asking, because when something has arisen, do you understand this has come to be? This has arisen. Yes, venerable sir. Because do you understand its origination occurs with that as nutriment? In other words, do you understand this thing has arisen with this as a necessary condition? Yes, venerable sir. Because do you see with the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation? Yes, venerable sir. The monks understand about necessary conditions. And this goes on, these questions go on for quite a while mildly interesting at first, and then they get, uh, well, a little boring, not so interesting. And then eventually it gets into the 12 links of dependent origination. It starts out with them in the forward order, and then a questionnaire with them in the reverse order. And then the recapitulation on the arising. Then there's the forward order of ceasing with the ceasing of ignorance as the ceasing of sankaras with the ceasing of sankaras, ceasing of consciousness. And then the reverse order. Monks, do you understand that with the ceasing of birth, old age, sickness, and death ceases? Yes, venerable sir. Do you, right? It just goes on. And on. And then finally, we get to the recapitulation on ceasing. I suspect all of these questions are a later insertion. Uh, they strike me as a catechism. Remember catechism, perhaps from your Sunday school days? You know, you're supposed to memorize the answers to all these questions. Well, the monks were supposed to memorize 
the 12 links of dependent origination forwards and backwards and what's dependent on what and so forth. And this is a very, if you can recite this, you got it. So somebody started inserting a few more questions in whatever was originally there till we wind up with this catechism. But eventually it comes back to the heart of the whole sutta. Bhikkhus, knowing and seeing in this way, that is viewing the world in terms of dependent origination. Would you run back to the past thus? Were we in the past? Were we not in the past? What were we in the past? How were we in the past? Having been what, what did we become in the past? No, venerable sir. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you run forward to the future thus? Shall we be in the future? Shall we not be in the future? What shall we be in the future? How shall we be in the future? Having been what, what shall we become in the future? No, venerable sir. Bhikkhus, knowing and seeing in this way, would you now be inwardly perplexed about the present thus? Am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? Where does this being come from? Where will it go? No, venerable sir. Bhikkhus, are you saying this because I'm your teacher? No, venerable sir. Are you saying this because of your own experience? Yes, venerable sir. So knowing and seeing in terms of dependent origination, you don't wonder, did I exist in the past? You don't wonder, will I exist in the future? You're not even confused about the present. You're just seeing that there's, well, nothing but streams of dependently arising processes interacting. When you really get dependent origination and how that's all that there is, then the question of was I in the past or what will I be in the future doesn't even arise. The arising of what was my past life, what will be my future life is dependent upon the assumption that there's some sort of entity here that was back there and will be in the future. But once you start seeing it's nothing but streams of dependently arising processes, then that question just disappears. So it's like if I ask you, if you fall off the edge of the world, does it hurt? Well, does it? I mean, come on, does it hurt if you fall off the edge of the world? Do you land on something and it hurts? Or, or do you just keep falling? And if you keep falling, like you go faster and faster until the friction with the air sets you on fire, that would hurt. Or, or do you just keep falling? I mean, if you fall off the edge of the world, what if you just keep falling and falling? I mean, do you eventually starve to death? That probably hurt. Come on, does it hurt if you fall off the edge of the world? Well, if you're not conceiving of the edge of the world, the question is like ridiculous. You wouldn't even wonder, does it hurt if you fall off the edge of the world, right? It just doesn't come up. If you see the world in terms of nothing but dependently arising processes interacting, then the question of did you exist in the past, will you exist in the future, doesn't come up. And this is the Buddha's reply to Sati. He's thinking that there's some essence of him and he's identified that it's his consciousness. And yeah, when he dies, his consciousness is going to find a new body and come back and get the resulting karma that didn't get ironed out before. And the Buddha is saying, no, 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 you're viewing the world in the wrong way. You're looking at entities instead of processes. You're trying to make things. And of course, you're making the most important thing is me. But me and every other thing isn't really there. There's just processes. That's all that's going on. This general understanding of dependent origination is quite a bit more powerful once you get it. A lot of questions just drop away. Now, the sutta goes on to talk about kamatanha, and I'll just briefly outline that because it's about so much dependent origination. It's basically that a kid is born 
finds things that are pleasant, gets all wrapped up in that, and craving and clinging is set in, and the dukkha arises. But it's the pleasant stuff that's out there that's being pursued that generates the problem. But a Tathagata arises in this world who teaches the Dhamma. Someone hears it, gains faith, goes forth, keeps the precepts, guards the senses, mindful, content with little, abandons the hindrances, practices the jhanas. In practicing the jhanas, they find pleasure that is far better than the usual sense pleasures. And now they're no longer entranced by those sense pleasures and are willing to give them up. And in so doing, give up craving and clinging. And that's how you overcome kama tanha, craving for sense pleasures. But this general case of dependent origination, the fact that everything arises dependent on other things, the fact that there's nothing but streams of dependently arising processes interacting, basically takes care of the whole question of past lives and future lives. They just don't come up any more than the question of, does it hurt if you fall off the edge of the world? 